Today, property investing by the numbers. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. I want today to discuss perhaps one of the most important issues facing property investors at the moment. And that is that there is a lot of noise out there and a lot of claims about really high returns from property investing. But when you look at the real numbers, the story is extremely different. Now, if you are buying a property for own occupation, you can clearly afford to pay over the odds if it really meets your needs and you consider the property not an investment, rather somewhere to live and grow and develop. But if you are a property investor, then you've got to be ruthless about the economics of the investment that you're making. And the fact of the matter is that my data suggests many people are just not looking at it right at all. So today, I'm going to use data from my core market model over the last year to highlight some of the key findings that I found when I analysed the information relating to property that's been invested over the last few years, and particularly its performance over the last year. And I need to introduce a couple of key concepts. Firstly, there's a difference between gross yield and net yield. Frankly, gross yield is a bit misleading because it's the relationship between the price of the property and the prospective rental return you might get. Whereas net yield takes account of the true costs of the investment you're making, including all of the various elements, for example, fees, if it's being managed by an agent, repairs and other costs too. So my argument will be that when you make an assessment of a property for investment purposes, the net yield is a better measure. The second point to make, of course, is that you'll also be thinking about prospective future capital growth. So in our data, not only do we look at net yield, but we also look at capital growth. Growth. And of course, in many parts of the country, until recently at least, prices have gone backward relatively recently. The final point to make is that clearly many people are still attracted by the tax breaks which are available in terms of negative gearing. However, with interest rates dropping and with some categories of costs now excluded from negative gearing, the tax breaks are not so powerful as they once were. And therefore, my analysis is going to exclude the tax related issue because, of course, it does depend on individual households, broader tax footprint. So with those introductions done, let me share with you some of the data that I've pulled out from my core market model. And just to remind you, this is based on an overall sample of 52,000 households and roughly one third of those households are property investors. So I'm going to start by looking at the gross and net rental yield across the states. And interestingly, if you sort the gross rental yield from highest to lowest, Tasmania comes out on top at 5.2% in terms of growth yield, followed by the Northern Territories at 5.17%, the ACT at 4.62%, Queensland at 4.54%, South Australia at 4.37%, Western Australia at 4.05%, New South Wales at 3.41%, and Victoria at 3.33%. Now, these are averages of all investment properties in each of the states. If you look at the net rental yield, so we're now sorting by the true effective return excepting for capital growth. Then Tasmania comes out at 1.27%, the Northern Territory at 1.5%, the ACT at 0.89%, Queensland at 0.69%, South Australia at 
Western Australia at 0.28%. And there are losses at a net rental yield level of minus 0.31% in New South Wales and minus 0.44% in Victoria. So in true net rental terms, so the answer is to invest in Tasmania, the NT, ACT or Queensland and avoid New South Wales and Victoria, which, by the way, many property investors are now doing. And I'd also make the point that if you look at the average property equity that's been created, now this, of course, is dependent upon when people bought and what price they bought at. But in fact, the average equity investment property is 183000 in the ACT, 132,000 in New South Wales, 118,000 in Queensland, 117,000 in Victoria, 112,000 in WA, 105,000 in South Australia, 92,000 in Tasmania, and 77,000 in NT. And there's the bind, because those with the higher returns tend to have the lower equity return. So that shows that you've got to be very careful when you make such assessments. Now I'm going to switch across to looking at our segmentation because it's something else that's really interesting. If you look at it on a gross rental yield basis, the more affluent households, our exclusive professionals and our young affluent households, are actually making returns in gross terms above 4%. Whereas those in the urban fringe and those with first generation roots in Australia are lower at 3.4%. Now, that of course tells some of the story, but not all of the story, because as I said, you really need to look at the net rental yield. And if you do that, well, you find that young affluents and exclusive professionals, so there's more affluent households, are doing better at 0.61 and 0.59%. Although, of course, those numbers are a lot lower than many people would want to admit. But as you go down the list, you can see that from the bottom, stressed seniors, disadvantaged fringe households, battling urban households, so they're on the urban fringe, the multicultural establishment households, and even wealthy seniors are actually, in net rental yield terms, on average, losing money. That's a big deal. And even young growing families and mature stable families are hardly making any return at all. And if you then sort the data by the property investment equity that's being created, on average exclusive professionals and mature stable families have the higher equity sitting there. That's because they've tended to buy larger properties and more leveraged, and also they bought longer time ago. Whereas those on the battling urban and disadvantaged fringe areas and stress seniors have very little equity, Young growing families has slightly more at 102,000 and young affluence 131,000. So it shows you that different household profiles lead to very different property investment outcomes. Now we can also make the same sort of analysis at a regional level. And on a gross rental yield basis, the most powerful Gross rental yields are in South Tasmania, Darwin, Alice Springs, North Tasmania, around Tennant Creek, Fitzroy, Wide Bay Burnett, Canberra, Brisbane and Moreton, and then it goes down to places like Adelaide. And you'll see that some of the more traditional areas like Sydney are way down the list, Melbourne even further down the list. Now, if I sort it the other way which is the least good gross rental yields. Then we find places like Ballarat, Seymour and Shepparton, Victorian Country, Bendigo, Horsham, Central Tablelands up in Queensland, Hunter Valley, and a few other areas too, are all looking pretty weak. And now if I look at the net rental yield, and we're going to sort again by the best returns, South Tasmania, Darwin, North Tasmania, Alice Springs, Tennant Creek, Canberra, Fitzroy, Wide Bay, Burnett, Brisbane and Moreton, the Central West and Adelaide, all have highish returns, but of course not great returns. And Ballarat, 
Warren Getter, Seymour and Shepparton, Victorian Country, Bendigo, Central Tablelands, Hunter, all have negative net yield returns on average. And if you sort the data by the largest capital appreciation, then Canberra, Warrnambool, Central Coast, Wybe Burnett, Curtin, Sydney, the South Coast, Fitzroy, North Coast and Melbourne have the largest totals. And if you turn it the other way, places like Tennant Creek, Warringatta, Ballarat, Southwest, Alice Springs and Horsham have the lowest equity returns and the lowest, of course, there are 43,000, 51,000, 52,000, 53,000. So very small returns, particularly when you bear in mind that many of them have net rental yields in negative territory. And we can look at the same information at a postcode level too. So the postcodes that are actually providing the highest average gross rental returns are places like Darwin City, 8,000, Colebrook, 7027 in Tasmania, Port Neal in South Australia, postcode 5604, and then back to South Tasmania where we've got places like Newtown, Seven Miles Beach and Legana. And it's quite interesting that Tasmania, Canberra and Adelaide are at the top of the list. Sort it the other way in terms of the lowest gross returns, then you find that Victoria is definitely the top of the list with places like Bendigo, Horsham, Ballarat and other areas of Melbourne all up there. And some of those returns are just around 2.5% in gross rental yield terms. Now, if you look at the average net rental yield by postcode, you can see that there are a couple over in WA around Kalgoorlie and then Darwin and Tasmania, Brisbane and Moreton Bay, South Tasmania, Kalgoorlie, Curtin, Darwin. Darwin City is quite up there at uh, a reasonably strong returns. But turn it around and look at the weakest ones. We find that the far north of the Queensland, the southwest of Queensland, other areas of Kalgoorlie and WA and other areas of Brisbane and Moreton Bay, as well as Melbourne, all are in deep negative territory. And it's worth saying at this point that net rental yields include three factors. Firstly, vacancy. So there are many properties that are actually not let at all. Secondly, the level of rentals that are being taken. In many cases, rentals have been written down quite strongly this year, particularly close into some of the central business districts. And thirdly, of course, the other costs of managing the property and maintaining the property. And finally, we'll just look at the average equity that's being created. And in fact, the strongest equity pools are in 2080 at Mount Kurungai, just north of Sydney up towards the central coast. And that's quite a significant pool of equity, despite the fact that the net rental yield is negative at the moment. And you can go down the list there and you can see that places like Adelaide, Canberra, Geelong, Far North Queensland and Kalgoorlie are there. And places like Seaforth in Sydney is also reasonably good on the equity front, but that's partly because, of course, people are more leveraged and prices are higher. And if we turn the data on its head and look at equity losses, we find that property investors on average are losing money in the North Coast, in New South Wales, around some of the Central Coast areas, Places up in Darling Downs and Queensland and Seymour and Shepparton in Victoria, as well as some areas of Kalgoorlie and Stirling and other areas of Melbourne too. So the key point here is you cannot just take an average of a whole area. You need to go very granular and look at individual properties in individual locations. Now there's another way that I can show the profile. This is showing the distribution of net rental yield and effectively you look horizontally between the deeply negative returns and the positive returns and the relative distribution of individual properties. So you can see there that we've got more properties at the net rental yield basis in negative territory than positive territory looking at the area under the graph. Now that's for the whole country and we can go down and look at each state in turn.
In the ACT, there are actually more positive returns at the net rental yield perspective relative to negative ones. But there are still some quite considerably negative stories too. If we look at New South Wales, you can see there that the majority of property investments at a net rental basis are losing money. Now, many property investors don't like to hear that and prefer to claim that everything's fine because of capital growth, but, but the fact is that capital growth may be weaker ahead. In the Northern Territory, things are looking pretty good. Most properties are in positive terms. And Queensland has both some positive news and some negative news. In South Australia, we find a somewhat similar picture with some properties losing quite a lot, others making good returns. Tasmania is a stellar performer, and that is, of course, because there is a significant level of interest in investing in Tasmania, and property prices are also continuing to rise, and there's a very short supply of investment property at the moment. On the other hand, Victoria has the largest footprint of negative net rental yield returns, and I guess you can blame the virus for some of that, but structurally, Returns on investment properties in Victoria were already underperforming the rest of the country even before COVID came along. And in Western Australia, there is a very mixed bag with some positivity, but also quite a lot of negative net rental returns. And quite a few of those negative returns are because there is still some vacancy away from the main areas of Round Perth, although that may be changing now. And finally, let's look at the overall footprint by our key segments. And you can see overall there is more negativity than positivity when it comes to net rental yields. But it's quite important to understand which segments are performing better. So we start with battling urban households. They often live on the urban fringe and have limited financial means. And there are more battling urban households losing money than making money in cash flow terms on their investment property. The story for the disadvantaged fringe is somewhat similar as well. On the other hand, exclusive professionals are tending to do somewhat better but that said, there is still a tale of exclusive professionals losing money in cash flow terms. If you look at the mature stable families, it's a bit the same story. Quite a few doing quite well with returns above 2%, but there are also quite a few with very weak returns and strongly negative answers. Now, the multicultural establishment group, those are the first generation migrants to Australia, are more likely to be losing money than gaining money, while rural families are a little bit more positive, but still there are quite a few who are in Struggle Street. Among stressed seniors, we see quite a few households also struggling in terms of returns, whereas the distribution of suburban mainstream households is a bit more equalised, with a number doing reasonably well, but also others elsewhere losing money. Now, some wealthy seniors clearly have an issue, although some are doing OK. The distribution suggests that there are more in negative territory, whereas young affluents have tended to perform better with more in positive territory relative to other groups. Whereas young growing families are just slightly ahead net-net, but there are still a considerable number looking at net rental yields of minus 2, minus 3%, which is a big deal. Now, I could take this analysis a lot further, but nevertheless, I think there's enough there to highlight a couple of key points. Firstly, the truth is that many property investors are losing money at the moment. And that's particularly when you look at it in net cash flow terms. And that's partly because there are high vacancy rates in some areas. The rentals are actually squeezed down. We've seen falls in some areas of 10% and more. And we also know that whilst interest rates have been cut on mortgages, quite a few people with investment properties are quite highly leveraged and therefore the mortgage repayments 
are still quite considerable. In addition, the management fees, the strata fees and the other costs of managing the investment property are also quite considerable. Now, whilst the saving grace may appear to be capital appreciation, I'm quite sceptical of all the claims of massive price rises ahead. There will be some areas, particularly houses, where value will be increasing. But I also believe that amongst units in some of our major centres, we will continue to see very weak price growth and, frankly, we could see more negative movements. And that means that if you have a negative cash flow return on your investment and negative capital growth, that property investment is not performing at all well. Now, what you should be doing on a regular basis is doing a calculation a bit like I've shown you here to make an assessment of the real return of the property. You cannot set and forget and hope it will be fine. The truth is that many property investors are losing money and will continue to lose money. And that's one reason why my surveys are highlighting that now we are in the new year, more will start to put their properties on the market. And the one third of properties that are held by property investors is where we're going to see a lot of the sale action in the next few months. So the bottom line is simply this. If you are considering a property for investment purposes, you must do the math. You must understand what the true likely return is. Don't just accept the top level positive number spruit by the real estate industry. And the other point to make is that if you own a portfolio of investment properties already, it's vital that you make an assessment of the true returns over time of those properties. And on average, I must tell you that 60% of investment property is losing money week in, week out at the moment. And even with all the government support and the other things that are going on, I'm not sure that's likely to change anytime soon. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.